I'll just quickly start by setting the context a little bit. Um, my name is Amar and I'm part of the Gender and Livelihoods team at IntelliCap. And as you might know, IntelliCap is part of the Avishkar group. Uh, and we have been looking at the concept of gender lens investing from a southern side perspective for some time now. And we've heard a lot of uh, you know great uh, insights over the last two sessions. Uh, I'll just touch upon some of our um, you know findings from looking at GLI as applied in developing countries. Maybe three or four things that really stood out for us. Um, so firstly, when GLI is being applied to women entrepreneurs, and there was a lot of conversation about women entrepreneurs, it's really important to to discern you know sub segments within women entrepreneurs and not treat them as one whole, but understand what are sub segments within them and kind of try to understand their specific and differentiated needs so that offerings can be tailored to them, financial offerings and non-financial offerings. So that's that's one. Secondly, we kind of, you know, really felt the need to talk about ramping up debt-based GLI. And we have heard that from our earlier panelists a little bit. Because often, some of these conversations tend to be very, very equity-focused. But then debt is probably a more apt uh, vehicle to channel general lens capital to, to such businesses. So that's, that's number two. Um, thirdly, uh, the need to focus on gender-inclusive businesses and women entrepreneurship, Supporting women entrepreneurs with GLI uh, is definitely a path that a lot of investors are taking. But it's also equally important to support gender inclusive businesses because if, if the ultimate aim is to is to meet SDG 5, um, then that is probably easier done at scale by supporting gender inclusive businesses than, than only women entrepreneurs. So that's number three. And the last one, which is probably most relevant in this case, is, is the role of the ecosystem. And we have spoken about, you know, ecosystems as applied to entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial ecosystems. And while it's important to support entrepreneurs with, with uh, you know, technical assistance and mentorship and incubation and acceleration, it's also important to talk about how can, how can ecosystems support the investors themselves, so the capital providers. So what can, what can the ecosystems do uh, to, to um, you know, shift the onus a little bit, if I may say that, from the entrepreneurs to the capital providers. Because when there is too much focus on ecosystem supporting entrepreneurs, what that does is that it kind of, it kind of, um, you know, sustains the, sustains the narrative that it is the entrepreneurs who somehow need to come to the level uh, and become investment ready, so to speak, where in capital providers can invest in them. But how can capital providers look inwards, you know, change some of their processes to take a couple of steps forward towards these entrepreneurs and being able to channel capital with, with a general lens. So how can the ecosystem help help capital providers? And we've heard some of this in some of the earlier panels. So is it through helping, uh, helping capital providers, uh, you know, source more efficiently? Is it by helping them um, do gender inclusive due diligence a bit more efficiently? Is it by helping them capture gender impact data a little bit more efficiently? So these are these are some of the ways the ecosystem can work. And I think I think we have a great panel here today with uh, you know voices from across the spectrum. Um, so what what I'll do is maybe I'll just I'll just go to my panelists and I'll request them to share their thoughts and at the same time um, uh, you know introduce them. So I'll first of all I'd like to like to go to uh, Ragini uh, and hear about Caspian's approach to data. Great. Thanks, so much. Uh, uh, at Caspian, um, you know, uh, we we have investors like FMO, um, Triodos, and um, and other. Uh, uh, we have investment from DFC also, and um, of course, uh, Sidbi. Uh, so, uh, like FMO said, it wasn't investor driven for us. Uh, this is we feel this is the right thing to do. Uh, in a way so we didn't have any targets or anything so our parent is a b corp certified so all our policies are anyway in the sense uh, screened for that and we of course meet all the investment uh, investment criteria for all these uh, things but the difference that we feel we did was that we did not it's very easy to do it in the letter 
but we thought we want to go beyond and do it in the spirit so and before we can start propagating it to our enterprises we thought we have to put that mirror on ourselves so we started with ourselves and uh, you know systematically built a culture where now we find that 58% of our senior management is women 40% of our total staff is women uh, we have women in board investment committee so it's sort of so that was the first thing because before we start then secondly in our impact in indicator uh, impact intake when we select an enterprise we uh, that is sort of a basic form where we look at their hr governance impact potential and at least they all have to meet the regulatory requirements so there are two three companies we had to reject because they didn't have maternity policy of 6 months and they didn't want to even uh, they didn't have intention to increase it also so we thought that we can't but of course what we cannot help is that they might have a policy and they may not implement it or something so that's something then the third thing we started to look at was divided our whole process into starting with sourcing that you know it's not a good uh, way to say okay we can we don't have a pipeline so we are not going to we have to make an extra effort you know go find where the women entrepreneurs are don't wait for them to come so we got ourselves plugged into any incubator or accelerator working with women we thought we'll invest with our time our mentoring our this so that women know that if they have uh, uh, you know they have a business which is debt ready they would think of us uh you know so that that is how we did in the sourcing part just be extensively be where we are going to find women entrepreneurs second thing that we did and i think janan you will appreciate this most of our incubator accelerators uh, do not integrate gender lens in their um sort of curriculum so it's like a standard curriculum uh, you know you have the product development and you have market research and all that and hr and business plan but they don't look at it from a gender lens and how it can be integrated uh, you know it is not like a women thing hr thing but it can be how you do your market research you test your products you you know things like that so uh, we got incubators to in, uh, include this and we were successful with two incubators to have this gender lens program so that every entrepreneurs have access to that so that was on the sourcing part in our due diligence one our credit facing team 50% is women so that sort of helps and then we get gender desegregated data from all our investing companies uh, on everything board ownership uh customers employees and that's how we track and of course just one data point in our if we receive 100 application if there are men founded 18 are likely to qualify because we have very strict standards for that but if the what we have seen with women founded companies the success rate is 33% so that's what i want to stop here and thanks a lot for that i think you've touched upon anything i will come back to you Uh, for for more thoughts, but you said something very interesting about making this gender inclusive incubation available to all entrepreneurs. Right. So not just women entrepreneurs, but how can we make all businesses gender inclusive? Yeah. Right. So that's where I would like to bring in women, and you know, hear a little bit about where you are. Since you straddle both the both the investment and the entrepreneurship ecosystem, uh, you know, sides. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, um, Ragini. Very interesting to hear that. um so you know when when wilgro started looking at you know as an incubator as one of india's first social enterprise incubators how are we going to sort of um you know play a role in influencing the whole incubator ecosystem when it comes to gender inclusion and as ragini said we did the same thing we first looked inwards um we changed our board composition from completely male dominated to now 50% representation of women our middle and senior management in the organization has Well, at the moment, I think forty-five uh, percent representation, and throughout the rest of the organization, we've always somehow attracted many, many women to work with us. Um, so that's always been great. Um, so that was the first thing we did, and I see how you know even those first initial steps play a big role in how the entire organization moves ahead in terms of looking at having gender smart incubation, what kind of prizes we're supporting, working with women entrepreneurs. So specifically, our uh, strategy in gender inclusion has three pillars. Uh, the first is making women entrepreneurs successful. So we really focus um, on market access because one of the things we learned through the women entrepreneurs we've worked with in the past 
is that there's a lot happening in the early stage space when it comes to grants and you know different types of competitions uh, but it when it comes to getting a foot in the door with a big customer uh, that's what's really lacking so we are focusing our uh, work with women entrepreneurs on market access uh, the second thing is we look at how can um, how can healthcare in terms of solutions for women uh, be more accessible, especially to low-income population from a perspective of inclusion of women in the workforce. And the third piece, uh, which is what Amar, you wanted me to talk about a little more, um, which is on actually being able to have gender-smart businesses, right? So we started this a couple of years ago. Uh, in fact, we worked with Value for Women uh, initially. They helped us in fine-tuning our incubation strategy to make it uh, more gender-smart. And... Um, what we did was we looked at across the value chain of six enterprises that we work with, how can women uh, become part of the value chain, right? How can we have more women coming in? And it started with something as simple as, you know, working with these enterprises to see gender disaggregated data, both within their teams, uh, but also amongst their customers, right? Um, and for many of them, um, surprisingly or not surprisingly, uh, the percentage of women customers, women end users were very high, phenomenally high enough to consider them a valid customer segment. So when we switch the narrative from saying you must do gender inclusion for X and Y reasons to say you're not looking at your customer segments in the way you should be. If 40% if of your customer segment is women, but your entire sales team is men, your entire market team is men, you are marketing in male dominated locations all of your marketing materials have male representation, you are clearly not effectively marketing to a big segment of your customers. So we learned along the way that when you're talking about developing a gender smart business, we at some point unfortunately need to drop the gender piece and just say, how do you do better business, smarter business? And when we started talking on those terms, and started showing the data and letting the data speak for itself, um, many of our enterprises themselves said, okay, this makes sense. And in fact, the market partnerships that we were bringing on board, they also saw, the market partners saw that, hey, we too have se seemed to be missing this. And they came to us and said, can you train our entire sales force on how to sell to women? This is a distributor working across rural locations uh, that has a portfolio of appliances which is enabling livelihood opportunities in rural areas. The entire sales force in the north about 100 folks, in the south about 80 folks, all men. And they decided to say that, okay, I think number one, we need to be hiring more women. Uh, and number two, we also need to be placed in positions, you know, where women frequent. Um, so we worked with folks that were able to then have uh, women com uh, commission-based sales agents we had women who were doing demos of the products. We had women addressing audiences of self-help groups saying, I purchased this product. This is the end user financer who was able to give me the loan. This is the entrepreneur who buybacks my produce. So the entire chain was then connected. Right. So over the last two years, we learned when it comes to an ecosystem perspective, there are multiple pieces, even though at the starting point, each piece seems like only one part of the of the solution, when they add up, it's phenomenally powerful. So for example, Shell Foundation was the one that actually supported this program and encouraged us in our budgets to include a learning component for Wilgro so that we are able to embed this learning into all of our processes and also to see how can we embed it into, how can we learn and then embed it into our enterprises, right? So Shell Foundation provided that insight, provided that financial support Value for Women was able to give us expertise to make our incubation program more gender smart. The entrepreneurs, of course, came with the solutions and the willingness to think about their customer segments differently. Our end user financiers saw merit in having, again, another customer base, which they had not necessarily looked at. Okay. So, so many pieces of the puzzle came together right through, you know, the entire value chain of this ecosystem. And now the results that we're seeing are really fantastic. Um, so I think what I'd like to say is that even though, um, you know, you start with smaller pieces, you say, okay, first let's look internally, then let's articulate a strategy. You start with smaller pieces, but then when you actually see everything coming together, and it does, 
uh, we've seen that. Um, what you can actually get on ground in terms of evidence is just mind blowing. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot for it, Jim. I think um, when we speak to investors, what we often hear is that where is the pipeline, right? When we speak to the entrepreneurs, what we often hear is, you know, where is the money in the ticket size and at the rate that I want. So that's that's where you know role of the intermediaries really comes in and becomes becomes more important. So thanks thanks a lot for sharing that. Um, with this, I would like to come to Shella and uh, you know request her to speak a little bit about first power and then also. You know, any thoughts on what uh, what Jinan said and how has your experience been in yeah. the gender inclusion? Yeah, so I've been listening to Jinan and it's like, you know, going back into our own um, process currently. We are also working with uh, Valley for Women who is doing the study for us. So as, uh, you know, as power systems, we started about 14 years ago in biomass. So the business itself was environmental friendly. We were talking about uh, you know, providing uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, no wastage. And so while we were doing that, we seem to be seen as a company which is um, like a foundation or a social work company. And, you know, I have to go back and tell them, no, we are a business. It makes business sense to do, uh, you know, provide electricity. So in this whole process of the last 14 years, I think, uh, and our challenge or an opportunity for future is that we are based out of Patna, which is Bihar. Uh, and we cater to uh, half UP East, UP and West Bihar, that combo, right? So uh, the, the company actually was started with uh, Shell Foundation's money first. And then uh, we right now have Shell Ventures as a partner, funding partner, and uh, along with NG, Swate Fund, and, uh, you know, a bit of technology by Rockefeller, which is Sparks Meter. Now, having these partners, they were looking at how do you progress? What is the technology? But nobody gave, nobody asked us, do you have the gender right? So when I joined in about 2018, I was the only woman. It was an all male outfit, top to bottom. Right, so that's the time when uh, we were required to report and the gender was always in the red it was only you know so on the board 25 percent now because we have four directors out of that one is a woman and she is the woman now all across you know so from there i felt that you know we need to do something because we were being questioned on why your gender ratio is i mean we were not questioned but it looked very lopsided right so we had this whole excuse that you know but now uh, conventional, um, you know, mindsets are not there. Women don't, we don't get women talent, except in the, uh, whatever, the lower round and executive round, the, the implementers. So four years now, we've been talking about how do we improve till the investors actually started asking us that you get this many points if you meet the 2x challenge, for instance. The 2x challenge, uh, you know, the board is not, uh, there are no board, uh, there are no founders who are women, but the other conditions, we could work on it. So we started work, however, given the constraints that we have with the, our own business, the money coming, the funding and all that, this initiative that we thought about would incur cost, right? So then I approached, uh, again, the TA funding for our partners, which is Wave Fund, and FMO. Uh, and right now we again have value for women who are their consultants doing a study both for our external as to what is our product, how is it viewed in the market which could be you know uh, gender centric, what can we do further to uh, say that okay you know women uh, should be we should focus on women-led businesses or not. So that study is going on right from all all you know contributions from all of uh, the four partners that we have, and uh, also internally, how do we make ourselves more inclusive? Right now, we have 12 women, you know, out of 380 men, so which is still not, you know, still five, two, three percent, you know. So I asked my team, I said, target these five percent. Let's go small step, 
and make it mandatory for all the department heads to at least look at uh, a percentage, a ratio that they need to have women. So all the salespeople, as Jalen was saying, they're all men. And they are selling at the village sites. Getting uh, women has is a mandate for the last two years, but they have not found a single uh, sales uh, girl, sales lady who's willing to join the team to sell. So we are looking at alternatives, whether we should, again, tie up. So, you know, Caspian's uh, interaction with all your groups would be very interesting. We, I can talk to you offline on that. Sure, uh, where, you know, you could tie up with women groups who will do this on a contract basis, a commission basis in the village. So this is not Delhi. This is not anywhere near the urban cities. This is the village area where you also have conventions. So now going a step ahead, we said, you know, we don't have the talent there. We need to, I mean, train, get people, um, train them, uh, train the girls, focus on sponsoring probably a section of skills. women in technical skills, tie up with the ITI, have our own technical, because we have a good technical skill lineup in our company itself, open a training center which only focuses on training women from village to village, you know, giving them that and then giving them a job. Uh, that, so how do you then let the community also agree that they will send their daughters or they send their, you know, even if age is not about, they'll send their daughters and girls to our training center. You know, so making the whole environment safe. So it's going, uh, we, we're thinking a little ahead as to just to generate, uh, you know, more women workers for us. We need to also uh, create the pipeline, the training, uh, the uh, branding of the company as such that women are attracted, that the community is attracted to, uh, you know, send their daughters and um, daughter-in-laws to work with us. Got it, got it. Thanks a lot. I think I think you have covered you know many important aspects in the sense that it kind of brings to the fore the importance of context, right? I think on the earlier panel we heard a little bit about or we heard from Anne Marie about you know regional disparities. That's right. Um, and it's very important to be very contextual. And this top-down approach might or might not work. And what else needs to needs to be done so that it, it works. And it kind of also makes me think about the gentleman who spoke about about government's role. Right? Maybe the government has a role to play here. Uh, maybe some of the other things that support GLI can be done by the government. And maybe it's a more you know, longer term intergenerational project. And, and Ragini, you mentioned earlier about you know, working on, on healthcare. So yeah, yeah so I, 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 that's, what, that's what I want to, want to hear from you. Yeah. Um, uh, but before, before uh, you know, mm -hmm. you, I just wanted to let you know. Yes. But before that, um, you know, I would like to uh, you know, come to Ranjana and hear a little bit about what you are hearing as an industry body from impact investors and what are their challenges. Yeah, thanks, Amar. And I think uh, uh, an excellent panel. And I think I'll go a lot richer in insights from my fellow panelists. I'd say, you know, as IIC, we've been an ecosystem builder and we are collecting data uh, in terms of the investment trends within the impact investing industry now for close to two years. And I think a year back is when we thought that, right, we want to make uh, significant efforts in terms of measuring or seeing where does the industry actually stands in terms of gender parity, in terms of, you know, gender lens investing or gender smart investing. Where do we actually stand? I won't say that, uh, you know, and, and we actually thought that, okay, I think we are as an industry body, maybe in a position that one day we'll be able to make benchmarks or gender scores on different organizations and uh, maybe track the you know progress of the industry from there. I won't say that we are there yet. I think it's a work in progress, but I think what we started doing uh, as an industry body was that we started seeing that whatever investments are happening, uh, what kind of, just to start with, I think how many women entrepreneurs were getting funded. Our first initial, you know, uh, report which came out uh, for, for the year 2021 uh, actually presented the data as, you know, one out of every five entrepreneurs funded was a woman entrepreneur. Uh, we know it's a very one-sided kind of definition and it's, it's, it's not enough. 
So uh, what we're trying to aim to do is go deeper into that. Actually look at all the investments and see how many products and services are women focused or gender smart or gender inclusive. Uh, I think our 20% data uh, looked too good actually to be true. And now the numbers we are actually looking at is I think less than 10%. So only 7% of the enterprises which got funding in the last say one year or so had uh, you know women focused or women smart products and all of that. And that's just one part of the story. Uh, if I think I was referring to some a publication which was I think 2-3 years dated which said that uh, women in, you know, especially on the, in the, on the fund management side, uh, they are very limited women. And that ratio might still be good in, in say, uh, you know, maybe uh, Western world or maybe other European countries. But in Asia, the numbers were pretty bad. I think that's the report which I'm talking about. I don't want to quote it here because I think the numbers looked very bad. And I don't think the situation would have much improved. So uh, I think as IIC or as an organization, I think we would also want to, uh, of course, with the support of the ecosystem, understand that where does the industry stand in terms of, you know, these benchmarks. Can we include also a category within GLI that we, which says that, okay, uh, if you're a fund manager, you know, this is the percentage of women in, in investment decisions and, you know, that is gender lens investing for us, you know, so, because I think that is also very important if you're talking about unconscious or conscious biases. And that is where the industry right now, you know, where it is. And as an industry body, I think we are taking baby steps to maybe cover it. And as, as we all said, that it's not a one day sort of a process. I think it's going to take them. And that is what we are aiming to do. I'll stop here. Yeah, thanks. I think, I think it's important. These baby steps are important. And we actually, in the last year, we worked with uh, multiple investors to you know, try and understand what are some of their specific you know, challenges to going from, from intention to action on, on general intimacy. And one of the topmost reasons that came out was actually bias, or unconscious bias. And maybe that's where that's where we need to start. Um, coming coming back to you, Ragini, I think uh, I would like to hear you respond to uh, what Shaila said. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it might not be possible to meet yeah. some of these targets and the jury is still out on whether targets exactly. is the way to go. Um, yeah. But given that you mentioned your work in, you know, yeah. with market access and working with customers and, and, and you know, healthcare, yeah. how does that fit into ensuring that businesses are able to become gender? Uh, so, um, yeah, um, just a point on unconscious bias. Um, we recognize that and we got all our staff from Payun to our CEO uh, sort of go through that unconscious bias training. So a very small pitch, it's not very expensive. Get all members to do it before they apply for membership in INC. If they have to renew it, they must have an unconscious bias training that. That's a small thing, you know, yeah. So, um, you know, Amar, um, it's very hard. And I think I tried to ask that question to the panel before. Um, it's very easy for us to say, okay, have a six month policy. Uh, we made it happen because, you know, this is what. Uh, but imagine for an entrepreneur and uh, look at um, our portfolio, 60% of them are loss making. They're just sort of uh, trying to get into that EBITDA positive zone from a gross margin positive zone, you know, so it's, it's very hard. So imagine if a company has 50 employees and one third of them are women and half of them are in that age that they could take maternity leave. So imagine the extra cost of having an alternate person covering up for six months. Then supposing they half of them do come back, you lose half of them, you waited for them for six months and you lose them not because they don't want to come in but because this is sort of a joint effort of society, culture, infrastructure we don't have enough support childcare is very expensive in terms of you know finding um, whatever you know um, uh, what do you say the crashes and other. it's not very expensive uh, like you know it may take one person's salary alone to do that so i might as well not work you know and then you're not assured of the care you you're not assured of the care also okay so i think 
it is very expensive uh, for an entrepreneur to do that and i'm happy to hear that her spouse investors are actually saying that we will if you are to ex qualify then you will get something out of it or more investment but i don't know how many entrepreneurs for how many entrepreneurs that cost is worth it because the the jury uh, is still out on the business case it's very good equality is fair we access to opportunity and all that is given we must try but there is a cost to it so uh, why you know will i choose a loss making company continuously if they can't repay my loan but they have 100% women staff i'm not sure because my investors are going to look at my npl and not lend me in next time Got yes it. yeah so i think that, i think that's the reality of it you know so even i experience it on a daily basis the convention that we talk about you know the thought process is not only in the community it is we are part of that community so convincing the ceo to the country yeah. director to go for these initiatives is i have to show them a cost benefit analysis before they agree and they are not looking at women inclusiveness or not they're looking at okay did we make a profit at the end of the day so unless it is you're talking money which is in the green they are not going to listen to you because we are short of money as she says so it is always the bucket of must have good to have, good to have versus a... whether the rest of us are going to survive this we it is a question of survival i just wanted to respond to you both just purely from the experiences we had over the last few years so um with these six entrepreneurs that we worked with um, of course not all ended up you know piloting uh um, these gender based strategies uh, i think maybe four out of the six went through with it but it took us a good a good one year of just talking getting data figuring out what to do um what makes sense for them then another uh, another lockdown comes everything gets deprioritized a good one year just went in conversing the next six months too it's almost like you're revisiting because after you come out of a lockdown it's like you're looking at your business afresh right so now the whole conversation of okay gender smart business gender disaggregated data gender based pilots starts all over again and that's what we saw but once all of that happened and we persisted over that period of time and that's where ecosystem players that support organizations doing this investor support that's where it matters we persisted um and then after that when we were able to demonstrate on ground the business case for having more women in your team that's when now they can do the cost benefit analysis because now they're seeing that okay there's a big customer segment my sales are increasing without having my female staff my sales are not going to increase i was not getting that 40% of my revenue that i'm going to get over the next quarter is going to come from women so then the cost benefit analysis you can actually do and we've seen it happen so it's certainly a long arduous process but from what i've seen it's possible and yeah. i think that's what's encouraging that's encouraging but right now we don't have the data to throw exactly. you know so we'll have to do that and again persist and i can see what the future looks like coming from <laughs> your your story but uh, it is going to be uh, a tough fight so is every, what i can see for for a business yeah and every context every business every stage is very different uh so yeah. and it, the business case will kick in over a long time so everybody needs that patience yeah. and like jinan said it starts with awareness so they are not doing this purposely they are just trying to run a business and we drop it you know so they do what is easy to do uh, means because they have many other challenges to solve right correct yes yeah. absolutely <laughs> so, um, so thanks thanks for that i think i think it kind of shows both sides of of the story a little bit while the ecosystem wants businesses to do it the investors want businesses to do it even the businesses want to do it but if it's not going to make like you said you know they are just trying to run a business if it's not going to make business sense it's it's probably going to get deprioritized and this you know uh, reminds me of something that was said on the earlier panel that GLI is not just investing in or channeling capital to women with you 
by by uh, you know foregoing returns. That's that's not GLI. GLI has to it has to be able to generate equal or additional returns. While I don't completely agree with the additional yeah. part, yeah. why why does it need to you know generate additional yeah. returns? Just equal is fine. Yeah. But but still, it's not GLI just you know giving away money just for the sake of channeling more capital. Exactly. So so with that in mind, you know, and um, Ragni, you said. That for Caspian, it was something that was probably not LP driven so much. It was already in your DNA. Yeah. So, what message would you give to other investors out there who are who are you know looking to go from from intention to to action uh, on on GLI? What how how should they go about it? Uh, I think uh, putting the spotlight on yourself first. Yeah. Starting. You know, every charity begins at home. Look at yourself. See what is stopping you from getting more women. Uh, you know, is that your policies? Is what is it that is not? So search extra. Do because you are in the position to do that. Before I go ahead and tell an enterprise, uh, it has to start at home. So I would say that start there. You know, identify and uh, look at every policy and see what is it that we can do in spirit. And intention has to come from the top. And I think it would have been better if Abhishek was in this panel because these are MDNs, you know, and that's where. So currently he's thinking that, you know, this woman has come back from the maternity leave. Yeah, great. But what is it that we can make to keep her there? So can we extend the work, he, uh, you know, work from home for 18 months? Then we tell him, what about other men, you know? Then he thinks, yeah, we need to do that. So there are additional costs. So... But the intent is that we want to do it. So I think we have to start from ourselves first. All right. Um, Shaila, does that sound like something? An we are already doing. <laughs> <laughs> We've already started with the help of other partners as well. But this is only the study phase. I am afraid when the time comes for implementations or, you know, they'll... They, I just know what they're going to tell us, what are policies, because it's going to be through the gender lens. And having heard all this and, uh, you know, kind of also experienced in the last many companies, this is how it's going to look like, because when the extra bit that comes, it has to be at, at our cost. Yeah. So do we then get the partners to fund that? Mm -hmm. Do we get, uh, you know, tie up with other foundations <coughs> Uh, to look at the product being subsidized for women so that we can at least the start is there to, you know, just get the start on it. Uh, so that is there. So that's what I was saying. Maybe the investments need to think about going that step forward and saying, you know, beyond the study, beyond the uh, implementation, how do you do that? What is the help that they will then give? as an extended fund or an extended, you know, so just not looking at and whether you are inclusive, but are you trying to become inclusive? What is your, uh, what are the projects? Does it make sense? Does it match with uh, your own, you know, um, values? And then go ahead and do that before they become, you know, so gender centric and inclusive. I will come back to you a little later to, you know, hear from you what message you would give to an investor. You know, we've heard from, you've heard this from her, but, but, <laughs> but, but I'll, I'll come back to you. But, you know, I would just like to, uh, you know, bring in Ranjana here. Does this sound realistic? Is this going to happen? Because if the expectation is that investors engage with communities, they engage in, in intergenerational questions, they engage uh, with the culture of the place, is it is it in the in their mandate to do it? And do you see investors doing that? Uh, I think there is no generalistic answer for that, Amar. Of course, I think we see organizations, you know, which are at you know one extreme of the spectrum, and we you see. I think we have examples right in front in our member base as well, right? We have Caspian doing you know um, enough and more. I think they're the first ones. I think probably to think about this and. And Arushka group, you should also see, right? I mean, they are very, I mean, of course, you know. And uh, I think in terms of, I mean, gender parity or gender-based policies and all, you are, they are there. Uh, is it, I mean, prevalent across the spectrum? Probably not or not. I think it's, it's not, 
it wouldn't be right to say that yeah everybody is there right now and uh, that is what our concern was also i think initially when we were talking about if 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 india is ready for gender parity or gender lens investing maybe not but i think unless we start thinking about it today unless we start saying benchmarking that okay this is where our right now today but i think in the next 5 years this is what we are going to do to maybe reach from an x to y that is what is probably going to make a difference uh, yeah but i think that is what we also hear from ground or what we hear from investors as well yeah I want to actually respond to uh, to Ranjana. Um, you know, we at Wilgro being an incubator, right? So we're at that middle point where we can influence um, the way a startup is able to grow, any SME is able to grow. Um, and for any of these enterprises that we work with, we know that you know one of the the only thing that any investor, whether it's an impact investor or a regular investor, is looking at is is this business going to be successful is it going to make money and so wilgro has taken that stance right that at the end of the day how can we make this business make money and luckily for us looking through a gender lens when you're incubating a company makes them make more money so um the way we are looking at it is you know when we talk to our entrepreneurs when we talk about gender smart incubation or just better incubation you know we say at the end of the day what's an investor going to look for it's going to see going to look at your balance sheet going to look at your pnl and that's what we're going to help you do this is a strategic approach to making your business grow and i think that kind of language and that narrative is something that really works and i'm hoping that over a period of time once this narrative goes on and on and spreads that investors too will start to say that hey are you looking at women as as a customer segment because you know that would make your business do better i'm hoping that it comes to that soon right so kind of you know using a gender aware business model canvas also and just one plug to what shaila was saying you know that how do investors differentiate between investors so for our fund our lps or our shareholders and for them their investors because they have a portfolio so there is has power which is making an effort and there is some x which is not making an effort so what are the is there a pool of capital which can incentivize can i give back some interest that i'm charging to a company uh, which is you know uh, which is doing well on gender parameters can i at least reduce their interest rate by 2% today i can't so are there incentives built in got it got it um so i am very mindful of time and i want to have some time for audience questions so i know we have a rather thin audience but i think it will be great if anybody anybody has any questions or for any of the panelists please yeah go ahead so first yeah ladies first always always uh thank you very inspiring discussion so i'm delphine i'm working for the european union i'm based here in delhi at the delegation I know a bit as power actually through um, our engagement with Electrify. Um, I wish there will be a time in the not so uh, far fetched future where your CEO or your 283 men uh, come instead of you on this panel, so that um, it will really show how important the issue is for them. Uh, so I think we still have a long way to go. Uh, but thank you for being there. this afternoon and um, uh, holding the flag for women empowerment i work for the eu and more and more we um work through blended finance um so we are known for giving out uh, grants um and more and more we uh, partner with financing institution to um foster Uh, more inclusive more sustainable investment uh with the objective of um you know the sdgs uh, uh uh objective in mind as a eu based here in india and you know one thing that uh, was uh, apparent in the discussion you you talk about it it cost money to have women in your workforce right you have these ladies who go on maternity leave now as an investor as a as a, an entrepreneur you need to factor this in your sort of um uh cost 
So is there any platform, is there any specific interlocutor where we would also need to sort of go and talk to, to sort of shift some of these policies and regulation to have these underlying issues addressed? Because we're talking about paid maternity leave, we are talking about, um, you know, crash and uh, early childhood uh, system in place to allow the woman here in this country to sort of embrace, um, you know, a uh, 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 job. So, I mean, as, a, as, as being in the game, I mean, who do you talk to? Who do, who are, where are you trying to, you know, bring that conversation so that the more systemic issues are also being looked at? Because you can't put all the blame and all the responsibilities on the entrepreneur and on the private sector, right? Of course, there is a strong role for, um, uh, for, for, for these to, 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 to come into action, but there is also a role for government and institutional stakeholder to also act. So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll uh, make an attempt. Uh, so see, uh, just simple. Paid maternity leave, six months, a diktat, um, you know, great, uh, wonderful. But it actually reduced women's workforce participation, right? So what if this six paid maternity leave was for parents? It's a parental leave. So you share it. So when I'm looking at interviewing a 30-year-old man, I know that even he can go for three months paternity leave. Then, then, you, then you're fine. You're... So that's the first thing. That I, yeah. So, so it is women and child development. So different stakeholders here, you know, women and child development, then the other gentlemen from Janagra. So that would be urban planning. Like as an entrepreneur, I can't worry if my shift lasts at eight o'clock, if the woman is going to find a bus stop, which is lighted, a public transport. So the urban planning, the, you know, so there are different stakeholders who need to bring gender lens into uh, everything that they think about. Yeah, my, mine is more of an observation than a, than a question. Uh, uh, there's one side of saying that, you know, general is in investing on a company. Uh, and there's also the other dimension of uh, investing for a cause, right? Um, uh, which helps women. Um, agriculture, for example, horticulture, agriculture across value chains are women driven, are powered by women. Mostly they, the sorting, grading, picking, plucking is all done by women, uh, right? So anything that we do to help that cause, reduce the drudgery, reduce their, is a, is a valid cause. In fact, Wilgro has helped us in, to that extent. We are one of the incubity companies that we are, I mean, um, uh, that has opened a market for us. For example, we're building the solar powered cold rooms for women farmers of Odisha, uh, thanks to Wilgro. Um, uh, has that given us a lot of, Additional revenue? No. Has that opened a market? Sure. Because, you know, there are, you're doing five SHGs in Odisha and there are seven lakh of them. Are all of them are customers? Perhaps not. But even if you're catering to 20% of them, that's fine. That's a huge market opening up. And you know, all these are women powered. You know, and we are making their life that much easy. So that extent, it's not only necessary that you know, we have women on board. That's fine. That's also important. But if we, if we make somebody else's job uh, easy, thanks to people like Wilgrow and um, GIZ and, and people like those, then you know, we are doing a, I mean, an equally important uh, job, I guess. Women rice farmers, they do replanting and it breaks my heart. <laughs> there is. Please let it scale. Yeah, I think you touched upon, you know, taking a sectoral approach or a sectoral lens when it comes to GL. And that is something that has been discussed in the past. That when we talk about women entrepreneurs or gender inclusive businesses, are there are there any particular sectors like agriculture, like textiles? You know, a lot of women are employed in the textile sector. So can something be done? to textile businesses uh, and, and channel more capital to, to that. So that's certainly, that's certainly uh, you know, a way to, uh, to ensure that impact at scale happens beyond, beyond just women entrepreneurs. And, and I think uh, we've all been talking about uh, you know, number of women, but I think Ushnisha on the earlier panel uh, said something very pertinent. It's not just about counting, but also you know, yeah, yeah. trying to understand what is the quality of quality. jobs that we are doing. And what more can be done for some of these employees, even if you have 60% of them 
are they are they doing doing the more work in a in a reasonable reasonable manner? So um, I think I think we are almost out of time. So what I'll do is I just I just uh, you know request uh, if anybody wants to uh, have some closing comments, I just request my panelists to uh, to do that. But Okay, let me let me try to let me try to you know um, so huh, where where do you see the sector two years down the line when we are at the again? What what do you think would have changed? Well, you know, um, I think one of the data points that you talked about, Ranjana, was just shocking to me. Um, not just about the number of women entrepreneurs that are supported by investors, but also the number of solutions in impact investing that are for women. I was terribly shocked also because I, our experience in Wilbur is so different. Um, I guess perhaps because, you know, we've been a social enterprise incubator for many, many years and perhaps, you know, we've been able, we're fortunate to have a good pipeline, but I think at least 50% of our portfolio at any given time uh, has been able to support, um, you know, more women either through livelihood opportunities or bettering health outcomes. Um, so I think I would love to see two years from now that that data point change and um, I think there's a lot that as an organization we're willing to you know share in terms of knowledge in terms of what gender smart um, you know incubation we carry out in terms of our pipeline that's why we run something like iPitch every year because we get such a fantastic pipeline and we're able to incubate you know only 30 every year um, there's a lot that Wilgro is willing to do to help either impact investors or other incubators along that journey um, so that's an open, I'd like to leave an open offer, uh, for that. That's, that's my ending comment. So lowest hanging fruit, Ranjana, plenary session on gender. I, <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think collaboration, like we can do a lot if we collaborate, uh, across. There's so much learning out there. Yeah. yeah. Intention and collaboration. I think limited point, I think I would also like to see more gender balanced audience also in the room. A much bigger, wider audience and uh, as gender balanced, I think, as we would want it to be. Yeah. So I think. Ditto. And uh, also uh, the investing partners, so to say, you know, see beyond just inclusive, inclusive, inclusiveness of the company uh, and make them enable them to go out of uh, their comfort zone to the communities where they can actually build uh, you know the next step all right all right thank you everybody for, for your time and such an engaging conversation thank you